Yes, parents do have a say on what their kids are exposed to in the classroom, especially when it comes to explicit content. Parents made that perfectly clear in the election, and they're about to make it clear again at the state capitol during Mama Bear Day on February 2nd. We're going to give you an update on that, plus some do's and don'ts Virginians can learn from California. Welcome to Speak Up Virginia, equipping you to speak up on the life, family, and freedom issues that matter most to you. From the Family Foundation, I'm your host, Candy Cushman, and I'm joined today by our president, Victoria Cobb. Well, Victoria, we have a special guest with us from California who's going to give us some really interesting perspective. But before we get into that, you had an important update you wanted to share with us from the state capitol. Yeah, I mean, we're getting ready for Parental Rights Advocacy Day, otherwise known as Mama Bear Day, standing up for our cubs. It's just around the corner, so I wanted to make sure we talked about it. It's on February 2nd, and basically what this is, what's going to happen is that parents and concerned citizens are going to come down to the Capitol on February 2nd, and they're going to basically be there to be a part of the committee action that happens on key parental rights bills. And then, of course, we hope they meet with their legislator afterwards. So if people want to figure out how to get involved in this, where to go to meet everybody participating, what do they do? Yeah, the most important thing is they actually need to go to our website to get registered. So you just go to familyfoundation.org. You'll see a banner on the top um, as you scroll through. And bottom line is the reason we need people to register is that the committee's going to happen right away in the morning. And that's a little different than we've had in the past. And so what we're hoping is we're going to do a, a little bit of a virtual thing ahead of time so that people get all the logistics from us directly and kind to hear about the bills they're going to be watching because we hope after that, you know, they then go talk to their legislators. Yeah. So registering gives you access to the virtual information that you need before that. And we need thousands, hundreds, thousands of parents to show up for this. This is where you stand up for your cubs, like Victoria was saying, that we need to take this issue that became the central issue during the election and back it up with action because this is where it's going to come to a head. Um, In this committee hearing, they're going to be talking about or voting on some of the key legislation that will most protect parental rights. So we need the parents and citizens' concerns about, about parental rights to show up. So Victoria, tell us some of the key legislation that likely will be uh, coming up in this committee hearing. Yeah, well, it's to your point, it's exactly straight out of the election. The things that we were talking about that parents were concerned about then that they then voted on, now we're going to see in committee. So bills like, for example, making sure that family life education is something that is actually an elective, that you can opt out of that as a parent if it's not appropriate. Same thing with the books. Remember the big discussion about the books um, that are in schools that aren't appropriate? We're going to go back at that and try to put back in a bill, and it's there in the General Assembly, so we're hoping it'll be heard that morning. And it's really saying, look, if a parent objects to a book that's in the curriculum, they ought to have an alternate. They ought to be able to make another decision as a parent to say, this isn't appropriate for my kid. There's also, of course, all the CRT stuff. And so we don't know exactly what will be heard that day, but they might even have an opportunity to voice their concerns about critical race theory and that getting into our, our education for our kids. Yeah, and one of the bills, I think, not only is it just um, that they would have an alternate, but they would be notified if there's going to be sexually explicit content coming up in the classroom and have a chance to actually review that, right, and then be given an alternate. Yeah, that's, I mean, the point is that parents should be the driver of their child's education. Therefore, they have to know what's going on and be able to act. And that's what's not in our school system well today. And I just want to mention one thing about the family life education, which is pretty much our state's banner sex education program, right? <laughs> Yes. Um, aren't we going to escalate that from opt out? Are we trying to escalate that from just opt out to opt in? Is that yeah, right? that's why we want to make it an elective. Like you choose you choose to go in band, you choose art. If you want to yeah. choose family life education, you can choose it. But you don't have to. And it's not assumed you're going to be in it if you don't take your child and sign a form to pull them out. Instead of every kid just automatically default in. Exactly. Okay. All right. So everybody, make sure you go to our website and get involved in this. If you can't come out, make sure you share this with people that can at familyfoundation.org. Well, I am excited that we have a special guest today, Jonathan Keller, and he has come all the way from the land of the woke, the land of the politically correct and extremely liberal, the People's Republic of California. Welcome, Jonathan. Hey, Candy. It is great to be in a red state for a change. Yes, it is, isn't it? Jonathan, 
you are what you might call Victoria Cobb's counterpart in California. In other words, you do what Victoria does here. You serve as president of a family policy council advocating for biblical principles and policy, except you do it in California. A little bit different of a landscape, that's for sure. Yeah. Now, what is the official name of your organization? So we are called the California Family Council. And as you mentioned, there's about 40 state-based family policy councils around the country. And we are very privileged to represent that, hold down the fort out in California. And it's really interesting traveling around the country, talking to other directors. It really does run the gamut. You have states like Virginia that are kind of purple, but now red. Mm -hmm. You have deep blue states like California and uh, Maryland, Massachusetts, New York. And then you have some that are more, uh, much more conservative, like Florida or Texas. But it's one of my favorite things about being in this movement is getting to work with great folks like Victoria and your whole team out here at the Family Foundation and really just seeing the ways God moves and works across our country in all these different ways. Right. And we're hoping to benefit from some of that perspective today from you. In particular, we want to hear some do's and don'ts what not to do based on your experience in California, for example. Um, but real quick, I know a lot of people might be wondering, all right, how in the world did you get this calling to advocate for family biblical principles in one of the most liberal states in the nation? Well, it starts on the fact that I was living there. <laughs> I On my Twitter bio, it says that I am a Kansas-born Californian. So both my parents actually were born in Kansas. They went to Kansas State University, go Wildcats. And I ended up in Fresno, California around age two, long story short, and then lived there and then in Sacramento for a few years. And my wife and I are back now in Fresno. So I was living in Fresno, uh, working actually at a pro-life organization. And I really had a heart for a lot of these issues, not just the sanctity of human life, but also a deep concern about God's design for marriage and the family unit, parental rights, religious liberty. And in 2013, I had the opportunity to apply for this position with California Family Council. Their CEO was stepping down. And honestly, Candy, I didn't think I was going to get it. I just I was on the board at the time, and the board members asked if I would put in my application. I thought it would be just a good chance to brush up my resume. I I really did not expect to be offered the position, but God had uh, some big plans, and some days I still kind of ask him what those plans were. <laughs> you know, you look at all the craziness that happens in the state, but it really has been amazing to see, even in a deep blue state like California, to see the ways that the Lord does work and does raise up a remnant of people who want to stand for truth, they want to stand for faith, and they really want to protect life, family, and liberty in the Golden State. And you're homeschooling parents, right? How many kids do you have? We only have two so far. We're very early in our homeschooling <laughs> journey. We have a uh, four-and-a-half-year-old, and we have an almost two-year-old. Okay. So we're we're just kind of in the preschool stage, but that's the direction we're looking at. Both my wife and I were actually homeschooled K through 12. Mm -hmm. So we, uh, I, it's not a, a requirement that we have to homeschool, but I think both of our, uh, both the grandmas would look at us a little bit cross-eyed <laughs> if we didn't at least consider it. Thanks for joining us for Speak Up Virginia, brought to you by the Family Foundation. If you're enjoying the show, help us encourage others to speak up by giving us a five-star review and sharing it with friends. Thanks for listening. So you are definitely part of the remnant leading the way for the future in California. And so, um, of course, a lot of people do look at that as the most topsy-turvy, you know, things opposite of what they should be states that we have in the nation. So I do want to just hear from you. If we just take some lessons from what you've seen there on what not to do here in Virginia, what would one of those lessons be? Well, I, I will say first off that on the topsy-turvy side, yeah, I don't think that anyone is going to cons uh, confuse our Governor Gavin Newsom for your new Governor Glenn Youngkin anytime <laughs> soon. Um, I'm a little bit jealous looking at some of the things he's been saying and doing already this week. It's it's a little tough, uh, little tough to go back to California under Gavin Newsom. But I would say one thing that I think you guys have already done, and I, I'm grateful, is that you guys are not ever giving up and not taking things for granted. That is maybe the, I would say, the do is don't give up, and the don't is don't take things for granted to start with. I think in a lot of cases, it can be very easy once you've elected a conservative-minded governor, a conservative-minded legislature, to just kind of say, oh, you know what, I can now take things off, I can take things easy, they're going to take care of it up there at the Capitol building. And sadly, I think that was a, 
a danger that we saw in California. Things were really good in our state for a long time. We had we actually had pretty conservative governance governance. We had Republican governors for all of the 1980s and all the way of the 90s into 1998. That was the first time in a long time that we had elected a Democrat governor. And then even after that, we had that brief kind of weird respite with Governor Schwarzenegger as mm -hmm. the governor. Not exactly a conservative, but slightly more conservative than Jerry Brown and Gavin Newsom. Yeah, people standing up for marriage. Yeah. Right? I mean, we passed Proposition 8 right. in 2008, which it feels now like a million years ago. But mm -hmm. a majority of California citizens stood up and said, we believe marriage should be between one man and one woman. So what happened? Well, I, I think sadly, in a lot of cases, people just looked at a couple of those big issues. They only focused on those issues at the top of the ticket, whether it was the governor's race or a big ballot campaign. And they forgot how important it is to look at your local races, whether that's your uh, state house representative in California, it's the assembly, our state senators, or even farther down the chain into school boards. And finally, I'll say, I think that's one area where we're starting to see some green shoots, some signs of life, that there is a lot more pushback now at the school board level, at the city council level, whether it's related to COVID and those school shutdowns or other policies, or whether it's related to CRT and uh, social emotional learning, all these types of things. I know you deal with those very same things mm -hmm. here in Virginia. I think that that type of parents, I won't say revolt, but that parent revolution that mm -hmm. is stepping up, I think that's something that we're seeing in California. It's, it's probably not going to have the same immediate impact that you've seen here in Virginia, but I think that's something that, honestly, I'd love for us to learn from you guys is just a reminder to don't ever give up and don't take things for granted. I like what you're saying about we can't afford not to pay attention to what's happening locally uh, because a lot of those local leaders, they rise up and eventually wind up, right, in the General Assembly. Um, so that kind of leads into that we have speak up teams that we're starting across the state, um, speak up Virginia teams. And I do encourage anyone listening right now to check that out, familyfoundation.org, look for speak up Virginia in the get involved section. Uh, let me get into the next question here. Well, I think you had one other kind of bad lesson and that had to do with safety in your state. Oh yeah. I, I think in California, the other thing I would warn you all about, we, we saw, especially last year, I know you've mentioned it here in, in downtown Richmond, some of the difficulties within the state in terms of crime and some of the defund the police movements. We've seen that certainly in California. Some of the parts of California are so bad. I mean, forget walking in downtown San Francisco after dark. I mean, you don't want to go there at high noon. But the good news is that I think it's a reminder that God cannot be mocked and that eventually truth wins out. And we even saw a couple of weeks ago the mayor of San Francisco, a woman named London Breed, she gave a press conference where she essentially said, all right, we, we have to put a stop to this. We have to hire more police. We have to be tougher on crime. And we can't just allow the city and the region to continue to spiral into chaos. And I think it's when you're seeing the mayor of San Francisco saying that, it's a reminder that eventually all of these policies that we're advocating against – they're going to bear fruit, and they're going to bear bad fruit. And I think that's why it's so important for Christians, for people of goodwill and good conscience to come together and say, look, there is a better way. There is a better option for taking care of our kids, for protecting our communities, and for creating a strong and lasting economy where families can flourish. Yes, that is a great example of God has a plan for us that we then ignore. Oh, we can do this better our own way. And oh, here we are ending up full circle. Maybe God had a good idea after all. And I'd say we are also dealing with that, like you said, in Richmond, uh, Mayor Stoney um, has dealt with this escalating crime that we now have to address. So I hope and pray we don't keep feathering that trend and that we can reverse course and not get to where San Francisco is at this moment. Um, but finally, Jonathan, I don't want to just talk about the bad. We should end on an up note here. Can you give a real quick encouragement on what Christians have been able to accomplish in California, even with all the onslaught and the spiritual battle that's there, what is a victory that you have seen Christians be able to accomplish? Well, one of the most exciting victories for me, it, it is a couple years old, but I bring it up because it is just such a clear example of God's faithfulness uh, and God really showing himself strong on behalf of his people. In 2018, there was a bill that was called AB 2943. It was essentially a counseling ban 
It would have prohibited not just professional counselors, but even pastors, youth pastors, Christian counselors from being able to offer help and hope to people who were struggling with unwanted same-sex attraction. If they voluntarily wanted that attra- um, sorry, that counseling, yeah, this bill would prevent them from even having access. To that's it. R- that's right. It, it would have been severely restricting on the rights of people to share their faith and the rights of people to share the message of hope from the gospel. And fortunately, this bill, I should say unfortunately, first it passed through the assembly, it passed all the way through the Senate, but that was a huge wake-up call for a lot of people in California. The church really came out of the woodwork. Uh, our friends at Focus on the Family, I know your former organization, yeah, really joined with us. I was there probably. Yeah. It, it, it was amazing to see the number of people, tens of thousands of people that signed online petitions and made phone calls and came out to the Capitol and testified in person in Sacramento. And the miracle was that on the final day of the legislative session, the bill had passed both houses. It just needed a concurrence vote for one amendment. And on the final day of the legislative session, the author of the bill actually withdrew it from consideration, even though it just needed a voice vote. Mm -hmm. He withdrew it from consideration in 2018, August 31st. And in his press conference, he said, after having conversations with members of the faith community, Mm -hmm. I want to continue the dialogue outside the legislative session. And that was something that if you would have told me even six months before when we were at the height of the battle, I thought, you know, it's good for us to fight this because it's the right thing to do. I honestly don't think I thought there was much of a prayer of stopping it. Mm. But it's a reminder that sometimes you have to take on these battles, even if it feels hopeless, even if it feels like a lost cause, even if, okay, God, I'm not sure how you're going to get all these Israelites from one side of the Red Sea to the other. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you just have to, as Moses said, stand still and see the deliverance of your God. I love that, Jonathan. You said that so well. That's very encouraging. We are definitely not, we have not seen the end of that particular battle. Um, You may have heard what's happening in Canada, where they are pretty much going after pastors' rights to be able to help people struggling with their sexuality. Um, I know we've had attempts here in Virginia repeatedly to have those same kind of bans, and I think we may even have one in place right now. Um, So this is definitely a battle that we'll continue to see, and I appreciate your encouragement that Christians can and will make a difference when they speak up on these issues. Thanks for joining us for this week's Speak Up Virginia, brought to you by the Family Foundation. Visit us at familyfoundation.org. That's familyfoundation.org. See you next time. And don't forget, we are stronger when we speak together.